So the, the way that I designed um, our session tonight is um, just to kind of do an overview of hospice, a little bit of history about compassionate care. Um, perhaps, you know, during that discussion, it'll help to differentiate a little bit about uh, why we're different, you know, from other hospice uh, groups, uh, providers. Um, so we'll talk about a little bit about our company as, as a whole. And then we'll talk about um, the volunteer piece as well, um, which is um, how everyday people can become involved in um, hospice services. Um, so I just invite you to take a look at the Introduction to Compassionate Care um, Hospice. And uh, just to introduce myself uh, from the beginning, uh, my name is Michael Freilich. I am a, a volunteer coordinator with Compassionate Care Hospice um, out of Taunton, Massachusetts. Um, so my role is to go into the communities and um, educate about hospice care um, and then share with uh, community members how they can become a part of our group and how they can give back uh, to our patients and their families. It's a really uh, beautiful program. Um, hospice is a philosophy of care that focuses on comfort for the patient. So when we kind of take a look at the medical community, we kind of see these two groups. We see curative, where we are trying to attack an illness, a condition. We're trying to rid a person of that. We want um, the, the patient and their family have made a conscious decision to, um, to go after a cure. On the other side of the coin, people have the option of pursuing comfort care. And what that means in terms of hospice is that we have um, an interdisciplinary team, which we're going to speak about a little bit more later in this program. Um, and the interdisciplinary team helps to recognize the various domains of an individual. So what does that mean? Um, comfort, the physical elements of comfort, the emotional elements of comfort, the psychosocial elements of comfort, the spiritual elements of comfort. Um, these are all uh, pieces of what make us human beings. Um, so it's important that at the end of life, when a person, uh, when an individual comes on hospice services, that there are staff that are specifically trained to provide um, support in these domains. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, Compassionate Care Hospice and who we are as a group. Uh, Compassionate Care Hospice, it's a special kind of care, a comprehensive program designed to support patients and their families during a difficult time. When life is drawing to a close, there are many challenges in addition to pain and symptom problems. There can be a myriad of emotional, social, spiritual complications and issues. Hospice has been created to address these concerns. The other piece, too, that I want to mention is in, the, um, in addition to addressing the needs of the patient, there's also the core of the family of the patient as well. So it's important for the hospice personnel to get a sense of, who, A, who is the patient and what, are their, what is their condition, what are their needs, and then what are the needs of the family, what are the dynamics of the family. So what happens is just a little bit more of that um, when a patient is becoming admitted to services, we talk about uh, with uh, the admission nurse, um, they're going to get a, uh, a history of the patient, a medical history uh, and a medical status of kind of what, what are they, what is the diagnosis from the medical team. And, uh, you know, the nurse will explain probably just introduce a little bit of hospice services and then following the nurse coming in the social worker is going to explain hospice services um, in more depth and talk about um, the people that are there for uh, 
the care and how to access them, how to contact them if you have concerns or questions that come up. Um, and get a sense of, you know, what are, what are the expectations from the patient and the family? What would you like? What, would, what helps you to feel most comfortable and most at peace, uh, both the patient and the family? Um, so that we, we keep that in mind. It's both about the patient and the family. To help keep patients comfortable, alert, and able to participate in life as fully as possible. This is another feature of hospice. Continuing on, to support and care for family and friends so they can remain attentive to the patient throughout their illness. To enhance the quality of life of the patient so they can continue to have opportunities to grow through search for meeting, making peace, and gaining experience. And I brought a little uh, collage, and we're going to speak about that a little bit afterwards in, the, uh, in, the, in our program this evening um, that volunteers can participate in with uh, the patient. So we'll, we'll come to that today as well. So just a little bit of history about uh, Compassionate Care. We were founded in 1993. It's a community-based organization uh, committed to providing the highest quality hospice care to patients, their families, close friends throughout 16 states. So some of the states in, in the U.S. that we offer services in compassionate care is Massachusetts, Michigan, New York, Nebraska, South Dakota, Carolina, and Virginia. We care for Ill, terminally ill patients with a wide range of illnesses, including cancer, advanced cardiac disorders, advanced neuro, neurological excuse me, disorders, AIDS, Lou Gehrig's disease, multiple sclerosis, and any end-stage disease. The phrase end-stage, that terminal piece, is what will, um, that's the criterion for um, a patient being able to be admitted. So with that being said, that definition is if the disease or condition that the patient has continues on for six months, within that six month time frame, the patient is expected to pass away. Should that, um, welcome. Let me get you, welcome. I'm Michael. I'm Laura. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, so it's a trajectory of time. So, um, you know, and again, it's very interesting because when we have our uh, interdisciplinary meetings, which every hospice does every two weeks, we, we talk about um, the disease progression and we talk about you know, what is most likely to occur. And to help us in that process, we have um, medical directors that come and join us for that meeting. Um, and what they're looking for are specific areas of decline. So um, as a whole hospice team, that's a big part of our, uh, of our objective is we want to make sure is this patient, are they declining? So certain ways that we can measure that, right? We can talk about how much is the patient eating. We can talk about how, much, how many hours in a day is the patient sleeping. Um, is the patient maybe combative? And of course that can be maybe perhaps related to other things. Um, I don't want to speak out of turn. I'm, I'm not a, a nurse or a doctor, but um, these are some of the things that, that we're talking about. So for example, you know, when uh, a patient is admitted to services, um, and then let's say in the beginning they're eating 75% of their meal at any given meal time, and then three months later they're eating 10% of their meal on the plate. And these are nurses that are doing that assessment when they're sitting with them and when the, when the home health aides are sitting with them during that time. That's a really good indication of potential decline because what happens with the body is that we no longer need um, food for sustenance um, when, when we are um, shortly to, to be expected to pass. So the, these are just kind of some examples of um, how to kind of look for that decline. What's very interesting is that the medical director during those IDT meetings can, um, they can decide either way. They could say, 
yep, this patient sounds good for hospice services. They qualify. So we use that word qualify. Um, on the other side of the coin, a patient may not qualify because um, maybe they're eating more. Maybe they're not sleeping as much. Um, maybe their interactions with people has increased. So these are kind of another way to kind of look um, to see could they qualify one one accept questions as we go along? Sure, I can I'll try my best to answer. Yeah. We were just commenting on yeah. qualified to be admitted for care. Yeah. And then depending on changing conditions with the patient, could that be reversed? Because in one case you expect them to pass within six months mm -hmm. and there's insurance coverages and all those other things that require right. Right. Uh, that apply. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, and, and I'm familiar with an individual case here, uh, renal failure was coming and all that sort of thing, mm -hmm. uh, kidneys failing. Mm -hmm. But withheld from the patient was any therapy or physical activity mm -hmm. because it was deemed as not helpful. Mm -hmm. That was reversed despite the low kidney function. And this patient received therapy, activity, and that was eight months ago. Mm -hmm. And she is stronger now, physically mm -hmm. and mentally, mm -hmm. probably a little better off than she was before. Wow. But to do that, it was surrender the coverage, go back to something else, sound like a complicated set of thresholds to allow you to be admitted to care mm -hmm. and then to consider reversing it because by withholding therapy and other potentially beneficial things you're almost accelerating mm -hmm. the decline of the patient mm -hmm. so I'll, I'll stop there but uh, later on I'd like a little if we could shed a little more light on the admission thresholds and mm -hmm. applicable care that, that can and cannot be provided uh, I'd like to hear a little more about that later. Sure, sure. And I'll, I'll try to do my very best to address address that. Um, the, the other piece, too, I just wanted to share is that if, if there are questions um, tonight and if I don't feel like I can provide a, a good response or at least if I feel like another of one of my colleagues could provide a better, more informative response, I'm certainly happy to, you know, take your contact info um, and we can be in touch with you because I don't want those questions to linger. Um, and I, I, I love your, your, um, your discussion. Um, so, um, yeah, I, th I, think, I think what happens is the, the idea is that we're going to provide, the, the hospice frame is going to provide services that best are providing care and comfort to the patient. Um, and the natural, because I think one of the things that you said is that it sounded like taking away something that could have been beneficial for that person is what, is, is, that, is that what, something that happened, right? Um, yeah. Um, so, and it, it is going to be, you know, a case by case, um, you know, s scenario as well in terms of what, what, what do the team feel is best. And there's a lot of conversations between uh, the, the clinicians of, of a hospice group um, and, the, and the medical directors as well. Um, so that it's a very, it's kind of an, it's an interesting point too for me. And I, and these are sometimes the scenarios which I kind of wish that I could be a fly on the wall as well in those conversations to kind of figure out, well, why we, we have maybe X, Y, Z intervention that we could provide to a patient and their family. Um, and this is the expected result. Um, and if it's positive, we probably would want to provide it. Um, and more specifically, positive in the sense that it's providing comfort to the patient and comfort to, uh, comfort to the family. Um, so I, I don't know if that touches on what you're saying, and I, I can't speak too much about the specific um, situation, but... Um, no, that's all right. I didn't mean to throw you... No, 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 it's not, yeah. You're playing a presentation. 
No, no, it doesn't at all. No, no. And I'm, I'm happy to, um, to get some more information, too, from um, the nurses that I work with, too, about, about that. Um, but it, it's, it's interesting, those conversations. And, you know, things will come up during the IDT meeting, and uh, our program director, who's a nurse, the nurses that are, are visiting our patients, are, um, you know, sometimes we'll wait for the medical director because they have maybe some of these questions as well, and they say, well, maybe the doctor could kind of shed some more light. We'd like to do X, Y, Z, um, and we have to make sure uh, that there's decline. The other, the other piece, too, about hospice is that we're, we're providing care because we, we, want to, we want to do that, and we want to have uh, the means to do so. So if, if we're... If we're doing things that, um, I mean, we, we will see patients, quote unquote, graduate from services because maybe they're getting better. We see them eating more, sleeping less, interacting more so. Um, so we, we'll, see, we'll see that. And then we also see patients that are declining. Um, but at the end of the day, we have to provide services that are uh, of care and comfort nature to both patient and the family. And... Um, the, at any given IDT meeting that the doctor will most likely say, yes, this patient is good for hospice services because as of that point, and, and they're checking, I think it's actually every 90 days we're doing the check, but every two weeks we have the IDT meeting as well, where the, the medical director is saying, yep, this patient qualifies, this is, this is fine. Because what they're thinking about is they're trying to get a sense of, you know, in that six month time frame, um, do we believe that the patient will be passed on at that point? Um, but yes, let me, um, let me get back to you about, about more of that. Um, we care for ter terminally ill patients with a ride. Yep, let me see. Uh, at Compassionate Care, we're committed to quality of life. Compassionate care enables patients and the loved ones to maximize quality of life. Most hospice patients are able to remain in the comfort and privacy of their own homes. And this is a really great point, too. So we have uh, patients that will reside and receive hospice services, both um, in their own homes. And then if there are um, individuals that are living in an assisted living or a nursing home, um, they can also receive care there as well. And it's interesting, too. The dynamic is actually very kind of an interesting piece because where the patient is residing, where do they live, um, could create some additional dynamics for the kind of care that, that we give as well. So just for example, it's going to be very different if a nurse is going to a assisted living facility and interacting with the nurses and the staff that are working there compared to if they're going to be doing a visit um, at a patient's home. Um, uh, just little, just just the the physical place of of where we're providing services um, is going to be different, um, and just uh, you know, but the the other piece too is that with within healthcare, uh, and this is a very Im important thing that that we talk about, and and I'll get to this also with the volunteer piece in a moment, um, but within the um, the healthcare domain. Um, there's that phrase that if, uh, if you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. So every single intervention and uh, support care uh, service that we're providing for patients and their families, um, these are all very well documented. And there's going to be a need to, to justify it as well. Um, and Medicare oversees that process, and they'll go to um, hospice groups to make sure that uh, they do audits. Uh, it's, it's called an, an audit, and um, th they make sure that the hospice is delivering uh, care to, to our clients the way that we need to be. Um, so a little bit just about the, the philosophy of care, and this is kind of, a, kind of an exciting uh, piece, I think, for, for a lot of people, especially for people that are working within hospice, because it really is a philosophy of service that we talk about. Um, so I remember I was starting a little bit earlier uh, this evening. Um, you know, when we kind of look at the, uh, the medical community, we have like these kind of two groups. We have a curative uh, path, and then we also have a uh, palliative care path. So curative, we kind of dif we differentiate between the two by saying curative is going after the illness, the condition, trying to cure that person of, of what they have, right? 
And then on the other side is palliative care, which is comfort. So a patient and their family, they're making a very conscious decision of, you know, what do we want to do? Do we want to just make sure that uh, mom or dad is, is comfortable? Or do we want to do all kinds of um, interventions uh, that, you know, and this might kind of help the families to decide if they want to do it. Some, sometimes the interventions could be just so invasive, um, you know, just from conversations that I've had, just kind of an, as, a, as an example, um, people that have animals that are maybe an older dog and maybe an animal or a cat is, you know, feeling um, ill or they feel like, you know, we don't really know how long we're going to have this animal. And s similar with, um, with a person is what do we want to do with X amount of months or years that our loved one has left? Do we want to do intensive, uh, potentially invasive treatment? Or do we want to make sure that they're comfortable in all those domains of, of their life? Um, so it's, and it's hard. It's not an easy process. And I think that's another big piece too. I'm, I would imagine that social workers at our hospice group have probably had these conversations with families that where they say, you know, what, what would you like to do? And even within our IDT meetings that we have every couple of weeks, um, the doctor or the nurses there will kind of say, well, you know, the family wants to do X, Y, Z, but that's, that's leaning into the curative, um, the curative uh, realm of, of medical treatment. Um, we have to make sure that families are wanting um, comfort, care and comfort, palliative care. May I offer a thought here? Yeah, please. Clearly at this juncture, what the patient wants and yes. if he or she wants is very important. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you for saying that. Too yes. many interventions could backfire and create all kinds of agony. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Yeah, and, and we're going to, and that's a really kind of a nice, um, uh, segue and just in a couple minutes I'm gonna go I want to make sure I keep a, a little eye on time because I want to talk about the, about the volunteer program too um, but but I'm so happy that you mentioned that because on the back let's actually maybe talk about this now since uh, uh, this gentleman uh, brought that up uh, very nicely is that uh, we can see in this little wheel here it gives us a nice visual of who is at the center of care and I think that's kind of what your comment is is uh, is, is going for. So it's the terminally ill patient is, is in the center of care. So we have the terminally ill patient here. The family and friends, those are the people that are caring, loving, supporting the patient, right? And the, the, the people that are providing hospice services are around that. So the nucleus is about the patient and the family. And then the physician, the social worker, chaplain, bereavement coordinator, volunteer coordinator, the home health aides, the nurses, the medical director, pharmacists when needed, speech, physical, occupational therapists, dietitians, perhaps. Um, these are all the people. But notice how the, the nucleus, the, where this wheel gets its energy and why it's able to rotate is because of the patients. If we don't have patients, we, we're not providing those services. So I think maybe now let's just take a little look at that and just kind of um, understand what, what does each discipline do um, specifically. Um, so let's start with, um, let me just go see the registered nurse. I'm going to maybe start with the nurse because it's very heavy on nursing, um, of course, as a palliative uh, care uh, provider. Um, they manage the patient's care. They stay within contact with the doctors, patients, families. They're doing the documentation. They're talking with um, the members of the IDT team, which is um, everybody else in the third uh, circle in the middle. Um, you know, they're, they're speaking with the family. They're getting feedback. Um, just for example, let's say that a nurse is having a conversation with um, a, a son or a daughter. You know, there could be a family where there are a few children of, of the patient that we have. And that can be sometimes challenging. So perhaps um, what that nurse might do is go to the social worker. She'll definitely speak with the group at our meeting. Um, but my guess is that she's also going to the social worker and explaining that um, you know we have a family, kind of a dynamic right now. Um, one child wants one thing, somebody wants something else. 
And it doesn't even necessarily have to be that. Maybe there's just some misunderstandings or just, it's just a very emotional time for everybody, both the patient, the family, the people that love them and care about them. Um, so that's, that's the, kind of the beauty of the IDT format of hospice is that um, all these domains of our life, um, our physical domain, our emotional domain, our psychosocial domain, our spiritual domain, we can, we can reach out and we can get support that way through hospice care. Um, the hospice aide will go down uh, towards the, the right here, going down to the middle. Hospice aide attends daily functions, cleansing, bathing, changing of clothes, helping with meals and general patient care. So they're doing what we call um, ADLs, which is activities of daily living uh, with the patients. Uh, the volunteer coordinator, so that's my uh, role within hospice. Um, so what, what I do, I don't actually need the paper for this, um, I hope not. Um, so I go out into the community and I recruit volunteers. Um, I educate uh, the public the best that I can about um, hospice care. Um, and how you know every everyday people can can become involved in um, in hospice through the volunteer program, um, and we're definitely going to speak on that as well tonight. I'm very excited about that. Um, our bereavement coordinator is another very important member of the IDT uh, team. Prior to the time of death, uh, the bere the bereavement coordinator assesses needs uh, that the family may have after the loss of their loved one, may include follow up visits, referring family members to counseling. So they can do referrals into the community, they can get other support, um, excuse me, other support devices for the patient and for the family uh, to feel uh, well looked out, well cared for and, and looked out for um, in addition to the services that, that we're um, providing for them. Uh, the chaplain is next on the right hand side of the wheel and they're providing um, spiritual support and spiritual counseling. Uh, they can also provide uh, community resources if families are looking for them. Uh, the patient and the family uh, may um, be looking for that. The other kind of interesting piece, I don't know if I mentioned before, but one of the interesting pieces about hospice is because it's so um, patient and family centered around for care, um, patients and families can deny any piece of hospice care, but they can receive other ones. So for example, if a patient and a family have a very good relationship um, in their church community um, or maybe in their synagogue. They could have a minister, a priest, a rabbi uh, come in. And I think actually that's something that our chaplain will um, check in about to see. And sometimes the family will just say, no, I'm going to decline chaplain services at this time um, because um, we already have a resource that's going to achieve that that goal. Um, that's something, another kind of point too to make is, is that something sometimes I will see um, just in terms of that volunteer piece. A patient family, they do not have to accept a volunteer. Um, it's there um, to, to, to have as, as part of their service. Um, but I have, it, it really is kind of like 50-50, you know, maybe out of, uh, you know, 20 patients, maybe eight, 10, will want to have uh, a volunteer come in. Um, and it's interesting too, sometimes I'm looking for that pattern. It's kind of like, are there more acceptance of volunteers um, if, there's, if, if the family is smaller? So it would kind of make sense, maybe perhaps logically, where um, you know, if, if there's not as many siblings, perhaps there might be uh, more of a need. But I, we actually see both, and honestly, I kind of take logic out of it in a sense because it's, it's not about logic. It really is about um, what the patient and the family needs for support. Um, that, you know, we could get families that have, you know, five or six children and they do want to volunteer because they can maybe rotate and, and share responsibility, but they also like to know that there's another um, pair of eyes and uh, compassionate eyes and ears visiting with their loved one. Um, and, and taking care. And that volunteer piece is, is important too because it can also serve as a little bit of a respite. And you know, that, that requires some pretty good logistics. It's not, I mean, I would love to be able to just say, um, you know, yep, one o'clock on Thursday afternoon, I've got a great volunteer that can drive to Plymouth 
and we're going to sit with dad for two and a half hours, you know, and, and you know, that's my goal, and that's a big part of why I'm doing this, this work. Um, so that's, that's a big part of, you know, why I go out into the communities, why I recruit, uh, why I educate about hospice and uh, the volunteer program um, is to build up that volunteer pool so that we have that volunteer power to go out and say, yes, I can sit with, uh, with this patient and uh, support them and their family. Uh, the social worker, they assess psychosocial needs and supports patient and family through counseling, social services, uh, support, and community resources. Um, so they're also, um, they also do an admission. Um, I think actually all the, all the clinical um, staff, so the clinical staff um, is the, uh, the nurses, the, uh, the physician, the social worker, the chaplain, the, uh, the bereavement coordinator, they can reach out to, um, to, the, to the family um, upon admission and figure out, you know, what it is that they, that they what are their expectations, what are going to help them the most. Um, and the social worker will explain, you know, more about hospice and make sure that, you know, this ho the hospice um, philosophy of care is what they're looking for and they're not, in fact, seeking curative treatment. Uh, the attending physician refers patient to hospice care and works with the team to develop and follow a personalized plan of psychological, emotional, and spiritual care. And then we also have, um, at our office, we have two medical directors and they alternate between one IDT meeting and another. Um, and they, you know, we, we speak about every single patient that we have on service and um, they give their feedback about whether they feel comfortable, can, can the patient um, stay on, or will they be, uh, will they be discharged. Uh, the speed, Excuse yes, sir. Yes. Attending physician, does that usually uh, refer to the person's personal care physician? Yeah, that's, that's my, I think it's a bit of a, a combination. Right, yeah, the attending physician, yep, so, so the patients will usually have um, their own physician as well, and they're going to be um, communicating with um, our team as well and, and um, our medical director, um, yeah, for care. Great, great distinction, yeah. Um, the speech, physical, and occupational therapist and dietitian, they work with the needs of the patient in physical or dietary ways to help them and their family manage quality of life issues with relation to communication, movement, daily tasks, and eating. The pharmacist provides, uh, furnishes, and supplies pharmaceuticals for palliative and symptom management. So again, it's about, it's about comfort care. So we're not you know, saying here we're going to prescribe you uh, this and then that's going to cure you. It's to, to be comfortable. Um, so if they have uh, pain in their leg, um, if they're experiencing constipation, um, if there's restlessness, if there's agitation, there's various things that, um, that the nurses can prescribe um, and then get, a, get an order for, uh, for that patient to make sure that they're comfortable and they're not, they're not suffering. Um, great. Let me, let me just take a look. We can kind of jump around. You, you are all welcome to keep these, um, these packets for yourself. Um, feel free. I mean, I have I made plenty uh, for tonight. Um, you're, you're welcome to bring um, more home if you have friends or family that you'd like to, you know, provide a little bit of literature to. Um, you know, it just speaks about hospice. If, if there might be people that might be interested in, in becoming involved. Um, so it's just about five after seven. Um, so a little bit of history of hospice. Uh, the word hospice comes from the Latin word for host. So this is on page 12. I'm sorry, I didn't mention that. Page 12 of that um, introduction packet. In the Middle Ages, it was used to describe a resting place for weary travelers. These medieval way stations gradually evolve over the centuries into special nursing facilities for the dying. Sisters of Charity in Dublin, Ireland operated the very first of these groups. Uh, their work spread to London, where Cicely Saunders established St. Christopher's Hospice in the 1960s. Dr. Saunders came to the United States to speak about hospice. The hospice movement in the United States began in the 1970s and used St. Christopher's as a model. The first hospice established in the United States was in the New Haven, Connecticut area, now known as Connecticut Hospice. This and all early U.S. hospices were totally operated by volunteers. Since then, the movement has grown to include over 2,000 hospice programs, which is really exciting to see, and it's growing. I mean, there's this, this, um, this care model is, is constantly growing. 
um, offering comprehensive care throughout America. Um, yeah, so let's go over this just kind of briefly, a couple little points here about how we differentiate between um, hospice and curative, and I spoke about that a little bit. Uh, medical care, this is on page 13, medical care is curative treatment addresses finding a cure for the problem and or addressing the symptoms of the disease with the appropriate treatments. So for example, treatments for pneumonia require certain medications, bed rest and sometimes hospitalization. There are known ways to treat the disease and dependent upon the age, circumstances, prior health conditions, and other factors do not necessarily require more serious treatment or spell out uh, a terminal prognosis. Palliative care programs generally address the physical, psychosocial, spiritual um, expectations um, and expectations of the patient with life-threatening illness. So that's a really big, uh, a big piece of hospice is that um, it has been determined that this patient is terminally diagnosed with their diagnosis and that if the d disease progression naturally continues um, over the next six months, the expectation is that the patient will be passing. Um, palliative care does not preclude aggressive treatment of an illness and provides comfort to patients and their loved ones. Patients receive palliative care from a team of doctors, nurses, social workers, and clergy in their home or a hospital, but also in nursing or assisted living facilities. Hospitals, hospices, skilled nursing facilities, and healthcare clinics provide these services, which may include a monthly visit to a doctor or weekly home visits from a social worker or nurse to help manage pain and symptoms. Excuse me. Um, the goal of hospice care is to keep pain and suffering of a person with a terminal diagnosis to a minimum and not to cure the illness. So we're not doing any curative, we're just providing comfort services. And we can, we can provide these services in the p comfort of a patient's home, in um, hospice centers, hospitals, skilled nursing homes, and other long-term uh, care facilities. Hospice is based on the belief that every person has the right to die pain-free with dignity with family and friends nearby. Like palliative care, a hospice team is comprised of doctors, nurses, caregivers, social workers, trained volunteers who manage the patient's pain and symptoms, assist with emotional and spiritual aspects of dying, provide needed medications and supplies, coach the family on how to care for the patient and provide bereavement counseling to surviving loved ones. Um, I think what we'll do, there's a good bit of history here, which is great. I think it's very interesting. I want to just make sure that we have enough time um, to talk a little bit about the volunteer program. Um, and then I can try to entertain some questions if there are any. Um, you're welcome to keep uh, these packets. If you'd like to provide your contact information, phone or email, one or the other or both, you're welcome to. There's a pen up there on the table. Um, I can certainly try to get some more information for people if you'd be interested. Um, and I am constantly um, providing trainings for the volunteer program. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, does everybody have a volunteer packet? It says volunteering. You have, okay, great. You have that, sir? Great, great. Um, so within hospice, um, you know, we, we talked about the interdisciplinary team, right? We talked about the doctors, the nurses, social workers, chaplains, the volunteer coordinator, um, the home health aides. Um, we talked about the patient, the family. Um, what's very interesting and, and what's really kind of a nice thing is that hospices um, not only want, but they expect volunteers to participate. Um, Medicare has a policy where 5% of the total amount of clinical hours that are provided from hospice clinicians have to come from a volunteer. So that's where I come in. <laughs> so that's why I go into the communities and I do the recruitment that I do. Um, and that's why all the volunteer uh, coordinators do the recruitment uh, and training that they do because the expectation is that when a patient and family would like a volunteer, we really want to make sure that we can, we do our best, our very best to, to send that volunteer there to the family. Um, so uh, within the hospice volunteering uh, realm, there are different kinds of ways that people can volunteer. Um, we have, I uh, probably mentioned before, uh, we have about 140 patients currently. That census is actively growing. We have our program director, our liaisons, 
um, pretty much our whole team kind of out there speaking about hospice, educating the public, um, going into communi communities, talking about hospice palliative care. Um, so we're, we're seeing admissions pretty much every day and, uh, and we on weekends as well. Hospice never sleeps. Hospice is open 24-7. Um, there's always an on-call nurse. Um, so I believe, and I don't quote me, but I believe that that means that um, at 2 o'clock on a Saturday morning, if there's a family that has a loved one that would like hospice services, I think we can uh, do an admission uh, for them. Um, so one type of volunteer is an administrative support volunteer, and these are also uh, wonderful volunteers. Uh, we have a lot of administrative responsibilities in the office. Um, we have, being a healthcare group, it is hospice, but it's also considered healthcare. Um, we do have to document everything that we do um, has to be documented and it has to be uh, justified and filed in very specific ways. Um, certainly now in, in 2018, most of the filing systems are electronic. Um, so we all have laptops and, and a lot of, most of that stuff is, is being done there. But I mean, even for myself, when I have volunteers that go out and they visit with patients, um, they're also writing a summary about um, what, what they did during uh, the visit itself. How, how did the patient react? What was their demeanor? Did they feel tired? Were they sleeping for most of the visit? Um, were they interactive? Were they making eye contact? Were they laughing? I had this incredible supervised visit with a new volunteer uh, a week ago. And this volunteer, so, I, so we do the training in the office or, at, or actually wherever. I mean, I can, I can meet a new potential volunteer where it works uh, for you. Uh, but this volunteer came to the office. We did, it was about four sessions, about two hours apiece. We talked about the philosophy um, and then how to provide uh, volunteer care interventions for patients and how to help them feel comfortable. Um, so we did this together, this volunteer, uh, the new volunteer and myself, and then the first visit that a volunteer will, will do, I like to go with them just to get a sense of, you know, does things make sense, you know, because it can be kind of nerve-wracking too, right? You go into a nursing home or assisted living and you don't, you don't know this patient this is the first time you're, you're meeting and you don't know the staff, the nursing staff, the, the home health aides that work at the facility, um, and you're, you're hoping you do a good job and you, you just want to provide. So um, I, I go as kind of a support, and I think a lot of volunteer coordinators do that um, as well, and I, I like that feature. Um, and during that visit, it was, it was totally incredible because what this patient was doing was whole, she did not let go of the hand of the new volunteer we were there, we did a 45 minute uh, visit with this patient and the, the, the patient was, was staring into her eyes and you know, massaging um, the volunteer's hair, laughing. It was a really amazing thing to see. Um, and that, the feedback when I'm, and I'm observing this of course, right? Because I'm in the room and that feedback, it kind of, it, it, it really confirms a lot of, I think, why we do this work. Um, and perhaps in that moment, that patient was, was um, comfortable and feeling uh, an emotional lift. She was laughing, she was making eye contact. Um, even at a couple points, the volunteer and the patient were kind of joking about me, and I welcome that. Hey, <laughs> you know, go, go, go as far as you want. Um, so that was a really nice thing to see. Um, so yeah, so there's the administrative um, support volunteers, so it's making packets, helping with filing, doing some like business type um, support in the office itself. Um, let's see, groups, sorry, it's um, yeah, sometimes groups will, uh, will approach us. There was a community group, um, there was a, a representative that came to our office and um, they were helping um, individuals that have had been perhaps um, involved in um, situations of domestic violence or you know have history of, of being assaulted in, in relationships and that kind of thing and I think part of their mission is to help those um, those individuals through that pain and, and the trauma of it and then also to find community programs that can help um, those um, people, you know, move forward a little bit or have something, have another piece, another additional 
um, activity, another an additional purpose to, to give back to the community. Um, and, and she had come to us and, and we were able to kind of collaborate a little and speak about hospice and, and how people can become involved. Um, let's see. Uh, the patient visitor volunteer. So this is on page uh, 24. Um, so this is a really uh, a big piece as well. Um, so we get uh, patients admitted every every day. Pretty much we have at least uh, you know a couple of admissions, um, or at least a few admissions per week, I should say. Um, and there are patients and families that would like to have a volunteer uh, to, to visit, and it could be just to kind of supplement what the family is already providing, you know, for their loved one. Um, Excuse me, the other reason it could be is uh, maybe as a respite. So maybe uh, the children of th their loved one on service might like to just take some time off, have coffee, go out to lunch, and then, you know, to kind of know that, um, that we have this, this volunteer that's been trained, um, that understands, you know, how to sit with a patient um, in peace, in quiet, or interacting. It's, it really is about um, being where the patient is at. Where is the patient at? Where is the family at? That's what's most important. Um, so that kind of lingering question um, is what do patients do? You know, so you're saying, Michael, that I can go and I can take this training class with you and become a volunteer. Uh, what would I do? And that's a great question. I'm glad you asked. Uh, your volunteer coordinator will discuss um, with each volunteer ahead of time the type of patient and family that will be visited. So what I like to do is I like to get um, a little bit of information about the patient. You know, things like what did they like to do for hobbies? What does their family structure look like? Do they like to travel? Do they like music? Do they like reading? Do they like, did they like, you know, playing sports? What kind of food did they like? These are kind of fun things that help to create that rapport between uh, a volunteer and, uh, and a patient. Um, and of course, you know, if there's other questions, you know, after I provide um, some information, I try my best. Um, I do attend the IDT meetings uh, on a, um, every other week. Um, so as I get new information about the pa patient and family, um, if, it's, if I feel like it's relevant to the volunteer to know um, about that, I will, I'll share that with you uh, for sure. Um, I'm available to, to reach out to, you know, if there's questions or challenges with, with visiting, you know, re reach out to me um, and, and that, kind of, that kind of thing. Uh, I'm, I'm here for you. I'm here for our patients, for their families, and for the team that I work with. Yeah. Think yeah. Are there security background checks on volunteers? Yes, yes, I'm glad you brought that up. So that's one of the features that um, for volunteers to start, that they would have to pass a quarry. Uh, a Cory background check, and then so we we collect that information um, upon um, your application. I actually did bring some applications tonight. If uh, if anybody is interested in, in that, you don't necessarily have to fill it out here. You can take it home if you'd like and think about it. Um, but I believe that's part of that packet um, up there as well, um, and just some information um, so we can process the background check. Yes, absolutely. Um, so you know, as a direct care volunteer, you know, well. What are, what are we going to do with them? So we have volunteers that will go and, and sit with them. You know, let's say that you have a patient that is um, sleeping. You know, I usually encourage a volunteer to say, okay, you know, could you sit with the patient for 20 to 30 minutes? Um, you could sing softly to them. You can speak softly to them. You can do a light, very gentle touch. And what's really special about these little interventions is, is it might seem so small and like, well, you know, what, what does that do? But it really does a lot because it lets the patient know that they're not alone. When, when somebody is at the end of life, a big part of the fear is dying alone and that nobody is maybe quote unquote ushering them, so to speak. And it's just very comforting to have that person sit with them. And we don't even have to talk. We don't have to sing. We can just sit there um, and be a supportive presence. Um, sometimes you might have a patient that's very interactive, like the, the patient that I sat with, uh, the new volunteer, a week ago. Uh, and they're laughing, and they're, and they're joking around with you, and they're smiling, and they're looking at you. 
Um, this is another really kind of a fun thing to, as well that you can do. This is a memory board, and I think, you know, typically we do these with our patients that are uh, dementia Alzheimer's for, as a diagnosis. But, you know, honestly, if a family, you know, says, hey, I'd love to make a memory board uh, for mom, you know, could, could a volunteer do that? You know, and, and, you know, I might request some pictures from the family members. I, I might say, you know, if you have some pictures that you'd like to uh, lend us, you know, I can make sure the volunteer gets them. Um, and a volunteer, use a volunteer, could make a board like this with a patient. You could sit with them at the bedside. You could cut um, colors of paper. Um, and what's really beautiful, I can pass this around too, what's really beautiful about this is that it helps to kind of explain and it represents the life of this patient. You know, um, there's, there's going to be a lot of people that are maybe, you know, coming into a room of a patient, and it's really nice. I mean, in general, we, we, when we work for hospice, we recognize, and a lot of people recognize already that these are human beings, you know, um, and it's a nice representation, or a nice reminder that these are human beings, they have uh, they, they have loved, they do love, they have interest, they have passion, they have excitement, they, they have purpose. They've defined a life for themselves, whether they're 55 or 95 on service. It really doesn't matter. Um, they're a human being, and this is a really kind of a fun way to celebrate their life and to affirm their life and um, gives them that peace and that, that dignity. I think that really kind of combines, uh, combines into that. Um, May I ask a little, yes, sir. A yeah. You introduced the group that you work with. Yes. Are there other hospice groups and are you in competition with them in some way? That's, that's a bit, yeah. yeah. And, and that's, that's a great, that's, that's a great, great question. question. So there, are, um, I think, I think it said something like 2000 hospice groups within the United States alone, um, and, and it really is. We, we are, there's a competitive nature to hospice organizations. Compassionate Care Hospice is number three in, um, I want to say it's number three in Massachusetts, or number three, um, I want to so make sure that I get, yeah. A hospice group, you're one of the possibilities, but there may be others as well. There may be others, others as well. Um, you know, one of the things that we, you know, pride ourselves on at Compassionate Care is our very quick response to patients and family needs. So we can, we can receive a, a phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning. Sure, it might take a little bit of time for the nurse to, you know, or the, the social worker to get dressed and then drive over to, the, to see the patient. But that's a really big piece of why, um, you know, people, people reach out to us. And it's, it's they, I think they can see our investment and our compassion uh, and our genuineness and just that desire to deliver those um, high quality uh, care services. Um, so I think that's a really big reason why, um, why we're, we're, we're on the top of the list. Um, I, I remember recently there was uh, another, we had a patient that was actually at a different hospice and they actually did transfer over to us. Actually, it's interesting that you bring that up because um, this happened, um, this was last week, early last week, I had heard a conversation between our clinical directors that um, it was a different hospice group and then they said, no, we want compassionate care. Um, we have a, a very big, um, per discipline, we have a very large staff. So we have um, several social workers, we have several chaplains, we have a big, big group of nurses, um, we have a program director, we have a group of liaisons that also go out into the community, they build those relationships with facilities, nursing homes, assisted livings, they educate about hospice. Um, and, I, and there's just been this really great response to the work that we've been doing um, and, just, and just our commitment to service. I think it really comes down to commitment to service and um, being able to make those adjustments. And yeah. I'm glad to see that hospice care is uh, growing and maturing in the yeah. country. And yeah. uh, having read a lot about the doctor, Otto Gawande, who wrote Being Mortal, mm -hmm. where his focus is on care and love and people. Yeah. Uh, and all that's going on right now with a lot of uh, 
very wealthy people trying to enlist his expertise to help make this really good. Mm -hmm. I said, that's great, I'm glad it's happening. Now, if in a specific case, if I needed to have my wife put into hospice care, yeah. or conversely, yeah. she needed yes. me, yeah. uh, or do I find that entry point? Do I start with my own primary care physician and ask for referrals? You, I, I think, think that's, that's an option. option. I, I think, think you can, um, I think having that conversation with the doctor, with your primary physician is, is of the utmost importance. Um, and then um, the doctor uh, and or your family can reach out directly to the hospice. So that, that actually happens um, you know, with us. So we, we get phone calls in the office and uh, we have a, an intake representative who takes those calls and will um, take down all the information about uh, the potential new patient, uh, their family, and then they, they sign them on to service. They let the nurse know. Um, the directors will, will get a sense and then they send a nurse to do the actual admission itself. But you're right, there is that communication piece, which I think is very important, um, you know, between your primary um, and then our our staff as well, so that, that communication piece is, is there. But I think having that conversation with the doctor is a, a great starting point, for sure. I see your focus primarily tonight is uh, to seek volunteers. It's, it's, it's been a little bit of both. I've been trying to, the, the goal of tonight's um, session, I don't know if I achieved it or, or not, um, was to provide an educational piece about hospice, it's kind of more of like an introduction about what services are, what does hospice mean, um, how to kind of differentiate it from uh, the curative model, um, and then also um, how people can become involved through the volunteer uh, program itself. And my, that is my role with hospice. I'm, I'm a volunteer coordinator, so that's a big part of, of what I do is, is the recruitment. But I, I, even before I get to that point of, of saying, to people, oh, not, hi, nice to meet you. Would you like to volunteer? I think it's important also just to let people know, like, well, what is hospice and what, what would I be doing and uh, why, why should I volunteer? And I, you know, I try my best to answer those questions. But um, I welcome the overview and I thank you for doing that. Oh, thank you, sir. I don't know that neither, either my wife and I are eventually able or in a position to volunteer so much as to yeah. be for the help, but yeah, we'll see. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm glad. Uh, thank you for your your attendance and for your your questions. And I I love I love the discussions. I think that's another part of my favorite piece of of doing these as well as is, is the discussions that can kind of blossom. And um, I also like not always having the answers. And I won't. I will never accuse myself of being an expert. Um, I have a little bit of experience, and I think that's kind of what I use to, you know, put on a session like today, um, and when I when I do the trainings. But um, but yeah, I mean, we're we're at about 7:30 now. If there's any other questions, please help yourself to coffee and donuts. I do have a sign-in form. You're welcome to put your contact info if you'd like more information. If not, that's fine too. I have my business cards, so if if you say, well, I might want to get in touch with Michael, but I don't want to get in touch with me. <laughs> That's fine, too. You can take my card. Um, there are some uh, brochures on volunteering, and there are some applications as well. So if you or people that you, you know might be interested, feel free to pass those out. Um, the best way to reach me um, is on, on my business card, I have a, uh, my work cell phone on the bottom and my work email. I am in the communities a lot during recruiting because we have, <laughs> we have 140 patients and a lot of them do want volunteers, so I'm trying my best to, to, uh, to, to build the pool. Um, but please feel free to reach out to me by email. Um, certainly, there, I didn't answer every single question tonight, um, but you know, feel free to email me, call me if there's questions, if you want more follow-up. Um, yeah, but it's been a pleasure. Thank you for, for coming today.